What's up everybody, it's Fatty Mansi here, your personal coach. And in this video, what you're going to see is the second half of the Q&A with Steven and I. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback on the first one, so thank you guys for your feedback. Uh, enjoy the second half, and don't forget to smash the like button and share it with your friends if it's helping you. Question we have. Stretching. Uh, when should I do it? After? Before? What kind? I'll let you lead, lead with uh, this. So I'm going to lead with this saying, first of all, it is dependent on the person. This is not an objective answer per se, but for me, personally, I can go in, stretch for five. I'm the guy that people hate because I'll go in and I'll stretch for five minutes. I'll get in, in the squat rack and within three, four warm-up sets, I'm hitting my, my top sets. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't like people like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it comes from the background. I was a catcher in baseball growing up, so I already have that hip mobility. Not to say that some days I'm not tight, but yeah, most people, I go in, guys in my gym, I, rural powerlifting centric gym, they're sitting there, they're stretching for a long time. I'm like, Okay, a little static stretching here, maybe a little band work, <laughs> five minutes. Like, and literally, like, getting under the bar is part of my stretching. But yeah, um, the difference, though, is um, especially between your style and my style is there is a modicum of tightness you want for powerlifting. Tightness makes you explosive. Um, now, you don't want to be too tight to where you're going to tear, but being hypermobile is actually a detriment. Um because you don't have that tightness that's going to spring your muscles, um, especially for people like me who I don't fully bomb out my squat, but I, I like to use that reflex tissue when I squat to create rebound. Well, if I'm hypermobile where I can go as a term is ass to grass, I'm going to get stapled because, first of all, I'm going way below competition depth that I need to. And secondly, um, I just need that tension. Um, and it's not to say you shouldn't stretch. I like to do my stretching afterwards. I like to get in at night. I do some yoga because I have the yoga mat at home. Um, I used to do yoga five days a week when I was back in California. The problem with that was I was becoming hypermobile, and I needed to peel back on that. Now, for other sport. people, oh, absolutely. It was one of those, like, it was great for when I was playing soccer and baseball at the same time, but I'd go in there, and like I said, I was going, like, six inches below competition depth on my squat, and getting stuck in the hole, which is obviously not something yeah. you want. So I definitely feel it's important for those that are very, very tight. But I personally, you know, 10 to 15 minutes before, um, and I include if you foam roll, which, you know, we can touch on on a different one because I know there's a lot of conflicting different ideas on foam rolling. But for, this, for the purposes of this, you know, I, I'm a minimalist. I like 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, you know, band work, uh, some dynamic stretching if I'm really feeling it. But for the most part, you know, I am I stay mobile enough during the day, and I think that's the key for everyone. Stretch yes. throughout the day. Stretch throughout the day. It's not enough Huge. to just go in and stretch. You get up in the morning, stretch it out. You know, you find yourself a little lull at work where you can't get some stretching in. Um, you know, it's kind of – if you ever notice why animals can just take off on a dead sprint, Watch your dog or your cat. They're constantly stretching all day long. They get up, they stretch their muscles out, you know what I mean? Um, that's the difference between them and us and why we can't just get off the chair and sprint because we're not stretching throughout the day. They're Whereas they leopards. Exactly. They wake <laughs> up, it's like, oh, here, let me hit this stretch real quick, you know, downward dog, maybe some up dog. I might, you know, <clears throat> and they get going. So I think that's something that is at least my takeaway for everyone is stretch throughout the day and you'll be better off. Yeah, I never really thought about it like that. That's, but that is huge. Um, and I always tell clients that, like, so first of all, um, like Steven said, everyone's going to be different with this. Uh, and it takes time, whether it, it takes time to know your body, to know if stretching for a long time helps you or uh, has a negative effect on, on your lifting. It's going to, again, depend, be dependent on your sport. Um, I would say if something feels tight, so to get on like what kind, uh, if something feels tight, do the static stretch, like the holds, okay? And if something feels like you can't go through the full range of motion 
for example, what comes to mind is like if your hamstrings, if, if you're trying to squat and you can't get to depth and it's your hamstrings, you feel like there's a ball in there, um, you need to foam roll that. Uh, now that's just general. Okay, yeah. that's, that's very general. Um, there's so many in depth, but I think that's huge what you said as far as getting up and moving around. Because what I'll notice with clients sometimes, or clients will tell me like, you know, their heels are coming up off of a squat or wh whatever the scenario is, you, you have, to, first of all, you have to know what your weaknesses are. Like if, Absolutely. If you've had sh shoulder surgery, just know that you're going to have to be paying more attention to maybe uh, rolling your lats, doing dislocators, wall slides, you know, all, all different types of things. If, if you sit down a lot, know you got to get up and walk around and, and maybe stretch your hips depending on how long you're walking. If you got tight calves, stretch your calves. Don't wait until the workout. Like I've been in this boat and I know a lot of people that are in this boat. Don't wait until 20, 30 minutes before the workout to be like, all right, I built up all this tightness. Now it's time to stretch. And now it's time for me to, to get going. Like, it's too late problem. at that point. Yeah, exactly. Attack it before it becomes a problem. And again, guys, it's easier said than done. But you'd be surprised with just getting up every half hour from your desk and moving around and just even just, you know, doing one of those like typical desk office stretches will do for your just general health. Forget, forget lifting now. We're just talking about general health. Uh, I definitely think... Look at stretching like you look at maybe your daily vitamins that keep you healthy. Take a proactive approach to it instead of a reactive. Know that because, like you said, a lot of people have desk jobs, you know, and, but you know you're going to go work out that night. No, take a proactive, like, I need to be moving a little bit when I can. I need to be stretching out because I want to be healthy later down the line. And I think that's a lot of – I mean, it's just having my bachelor's in healthcare – it's a problem in America to begin yeah. with is we're very reactive. The, the medical system, everything we do is very reactive and we're not very proactive. So I think in this case, like we both touched on, be proactive about your stretching. Don't wait till 20 minutes before your workout uh, because that's how you end up having to sit there for 40, 45 minutes trying to get loose. And at that point, you beat the crap out of your muscles so much that you're going to be useless working out anyways. Right. Um, you don't necessarily need to be as minimalist as me. But if you're sitting there and it takes you 45 minutes to loosen up, you need to change stuff outside of the gym. Yeah, and, and I think you touched on it as well. Like your warm-up sets should be part of technically your stretching. Like I, like I said, I know people that will walk into the gym and, uh, and I don't recommend this at all. Uh, we'll throw like 225 on there. I'm like, uh, I wouldn't really recommend that no matter how strong you are. But – no. You know, that's just, that's just my, my personal opinion, but use your work up sets, you know, and by work up sets, like one, two, three, however many warm up sets you need and use that as part of your, your stretching and warm up because you're going to be moving through that range of motion anyways. So use that as part of your stretching. Oh, absolutely. On the ground. Like I know for my squats, when I'm doing just the bar, I'll do pause squats with the bar, deep pause squats with the bar, half reps with the bar, uh, speed reps with the bar, just simply to get the blood flowing and moving. I mean, for me, I mean, it's all relative to the person, but for me, the bar is literally nothing. Um, it's barely over 10% of my max load, but that bar is, you know, it adds that weight to you. Plus you get to work on some technique. I mean, you sit in the hole with just the bar for 20 seconds. It's kind of, that bar starts to get a little heavy, um, right. no matter how strong you are. Because, but you can use that just as some extra tension to, you know, warm yourself up. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think we both agree on that one. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how frequently can can a muscle be be trained in a week before reaching overtraining? Okay, so. Um, Here's the thing with overtraining. You're generally not overtraining. You're under-recovering. Um, and that is a 
generally for the general population, especially people I, just got their minds blown right now. Right. I mean, like, especially for anybody on my team, none of my team, and I've got, uh, I've got people that are nationally qualified, world qualified. None of my team do this professionally. Professionals take, say, football players. They're at practice eight hours a day, you know, whether it be in the weight room, whether it's on the field. Those are the types of people that can overtrain because you're putting so many hours. If you're that person where you're putting 10 hours a week in the gym, you know, two hours, five days a week, whatever it is, you're not overtraining. You're under recovering. And in that means your nutrition might be off. I mean, I'm not going to say one specifically because it could be anything or mixture. Nutrition, rest, prehabilitation, rehabilitation, everything that it takes to keep you in working order, something is missing. Um, now, that's not to say there isn't a – for at least in powerlifting, we have more of not necessarily muscle groups that we can overtrain, but we have a general guideline like bench being – requiring less muscles or smaller muscles you can bench more often three to four days squats two to three uh deadlifts generally one to two i know some people go as far as like my coach goes as far as to say you know 20 percent of his volume comes from deadlifts and that's his wheelhouse anything more than that you might have too much cumulative fatigue to recover from based on your lifestyle so it comes down to knowing what your body can handle, but you're not overtraining. Overtraining requires you to absolutely destroy your CNS to the point where you need a very, very large deload. And for that to happen on 10 hours a week means you're not sleeping ever. Right. Ever. So I think it's kind of thing. a lot of people – confuse overtraining with under recovering and that's really what you're doing is under recovering you're not allowing your body to heal through one of those different ways and uh i know that people are like well i don't know this so-and-so says he overtrained like no he's under recovering if it's joe it's joe schmo at your gym he says oh, i overtrained i needed da, 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 da. i'm like no he's probably under recovering because if he's got a nine to five job a family whatever he's only in the gym 10 maybe 15 hours a week Right. And that's not enough to overtrain. You got pro athletes putting in that in two days. This guy's doing that in five, six sessions. So yeah. you're, you're, you're under recovering is what you really need to look at and analyze. Yeah. I mean, something I'll just kind of piggyback off you, but something I always ask people when they feel like, oh, I'm just, I'm slow. Again, my forte is like fat loss and muscle building so generally like in a fat loss phase it's normal to uh start you know kind of feeling having less energy depending on how long you've dieted or maybe not if you're just one of those lucky ones that you can get away with lots of calories you might not feel that but if you are feeling that while you're dieting or, or while you're on a cutting phase that's fairly normal but two questions I always ask is how's your sleep and how's your water intake? Like those are so underrated. Um, and it, it drives me crazy. Like, Oh, but I got this and I got this and I got this and I got this. I'm like, well, all right. Well, you know, you have to control what you can control. Like, Oh I yeah. I th we don't have magic pills for you. And there's, I mean, there's magic stuff out there, but there's, there's no, there's nothing you can buy at GNC. Um, that's gonna like help you with only sleeping three hours a day. Like you might be able to get away with it for a week or two weeks and just think you're invisible. And then all of a sudden you're just going to crash and burn. Absolutely. I mean, um, just kind of as a story for this overtrain thing. Uh, what I used to do, like my bodybuilding workouts, I was playing indoor soccer three nights a week, baseball three days a week training five days a week, three of which I had squats, and I still never hit a point where I was overtraining. So, and I am, I am no physical specimen when it comes to athletic activity. I mean, I've played sports my whole entire life, but uh, nobody's going to confuse me for, you know, Usain Bolt or anybody, like, you know, any high-level athlete. And if I can pull all that off on 1,800 calories and not be overtrained, I can tell you people are under-recovering. Because 
just by I, I'm getting tired just thinking about what I did back then, right. let alone you know actually having to do it. Yeah, and I think yeah you know, I haven't gone to <laughs> to that extreme, um, but uh, I'll touch on this and I kind of want to see your opinion of it when you were doing that. Um, overtraining again, it takes it takes a long time, but to avoid that or you know, besides what we just touched on is like varying rep ranges you know oh, for example i'm not gonna if let's say you're squatting every day or benching every day i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna be working up to like a one rep max or a two rep max every workout right. oh, uh, oh god no yeah or like i might be one day having really high reps one day medium reps one day low reps and varying the weight as well in between um, I don't know if that's what you were doing when you were going through that. You're gonna, <laughs> you're, you're gonna laugh when you hear what I used to do. Uh, so as far as my squat routine, I was doing one day a week in the two to three rep range. Um, you know, sticking around 80, 85 percent. I never was going after like one rep maxes, except every once in a while. Um, one day was five by five, and I had one day where I did German volume training, which for those of you that don't know is ten by ten. <laughs> and that was my squat routine. I didn't know what I was doing completely. Yeah. As you can, as anybody listening, this was before I was coaching. Um, so Sometimes it's good to not know what you're doing. To be honest with you, you really can push yourself to places your body probably never should go. To be completely <laughs> honest, um, I think, I think what but a lot still, of people try like the the weight was varying and the reps were very, like I'm absolutely sure changed the weight. Oh god, <laughs> yeah. My 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 ten by ten was not anywhere near what I was doing for my twos or even fives. So right. yeah, it was down in somewhere like the 150 range where it was one of those things where I'm just getting work in, you know, tearing the muscle, doing what I can to create a caloric deficit. Cause that's all I cared about. This was when I was trying to be lean. Um, and so by doing so soccer, baseball, training five days a week to it. It worked out. I got very lean right, compared to what right. I was in a, in a year. I dropped about 40 pounds and had abs for the first time in my life, which right. was kind of cool, but it was was like, um, yeah, you have to vary the rep range. Um, and about taking D loads, um, D loads are probably the most boring thing in the world. You're going to hate every minute of it because What's generally, a load, Steven, what's a okay. D load is this super time where everything you're doing on your big three, at least in powerlifting, is at like 50%, maybe up to 60%. So you're sitting there doing like five by five, four by six. And so for me, who's got a moderately I, I aggressively mediocre squat at 402, you're talking about I'm squatting like triples to fives at like 200 pounds mind you i warm up with more than that um i actually skipped 200 because at my gym we use kilo so i literally 155 to like 231 so 200 is not even on my radar and it's like you have to go in but it allows your cns to recover it forces you to rest and that is huge now the frequency of deload depends on the frequency and intensity of programming um, some people can go deloads longer, um, especially hypertrophy phases. You can go longer. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when I peak somebody for a meet, you, you generally come off two or three strength phases and then three weeks of really high intensity lifts. And then, excuse me, meet week, it's literally two days working at like one day is like three by three at 70 and the next day is like two by three or three by two at 60. And then they take three days off. Right. So that is a competition style deload. Everybody does it differently. Now another one, a general one for people is basically I back down. Um, another good tool for people to use is what we call a mini deload. So you've gone into, you've gone like three weeks of high intensity and then you're basically getting the same rep ranges and work, but you might knock down the percentage five to seven and a half percent that you were currently using the week before. So you're still moderately working hard, but you're not working as hard as you were the week before. So you bring basically your maximum recoverable volume, your volume that you're using below that. Right. Yeah. And I do deloads with clients as well sometimes, even though, again, primarily like hypertrophy. Right. But it's going to depend on them. Like there's usually telltale signs, uh, whether it's like 
I'm not sleeping well enough. I'm not eating well. I'm not getting my macros in. Or I'm not getting my calories in. I feel tired. I feel lethargic all the time. Like these are all telltale signs um, that I actually, I think I just recently put a post on it on Instagram. Um, but these are all like telltale signs of when it's time to take a deload. Uh, again, you could, if you're a gym rat, you could just go in there and, you know, go work out with a friend. Um, make sure they're not killing you. <laughs> uh, yeah, go, absolutely. Yeah, like, hey, let's let's go max out. Uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, I, but I think, like you said, like, it, as a, and you kind of touched on this in a roundabout way. As a coach, sometimes you have to force your client to rest. Yeah. Because I have people that, you know, especially the ones that are all about the gym, which there's, you know, if you're at a point in your life where you can be that, that's great. But the problem is you burn out faster. Um, especially in my experience in powerlifting, a four-day split is better than a five-day split. But I get the new people that want to come in on a five-day split, which obviously means less time to recover. So it's kind of like, so they'll tend to get burned out a little faster, especially, you know, um, if they're college students so you and have jobs. So now it's like, I've got a job. I'm in class all the time. And I'm putting X amount of hours in the gym. And my job is like, all right, you know what? I need to back you down because you're not going to do it yourself. Correct. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not necessarily a, a deload is not a bad thing. Like more than anything, it becomes a mental break, uh, which is, which is huge. And kind of to touch on what you were saying is what I notice is a lot of people will, and it just sounds so cliche, but it's, it's so true in everything. Like, People compare themselves to others and they're like, you know, it'll, and it'll come out like when you least expect it, they'll be talking to you and, well, I've seen so-and-so at the gym and they go every single day or they go five days a week. I'm like, you know what? That's great. You're not them. Absolutely. You can't compare yourself to them because they can recover faster. Maybe they're not doing the weights you're doing or maybe they are. And if they are and they're recovering faster, like, we can't do anything about that. Like your body's telling you it's time to take a break. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think deload is huge. I didn't even include that in, in my part, but I'm glad you did Yeah, uh, it's, on your end. I mean, it like, comes down to, like you said, about the comparison thing is don't compare yourself to anyone else. You're not them. You're not on their program. They're not you. You're not on their program. Trust me, I would love to be like Chris Kraft who squats every day, um, which is doable. It, it, but it requires like really fine tuning what you're doing each day. He's not going in doing like five to seven sets of squats. He might go in and do two or three sets of maybe a double or triple and he's done for the day, but that's how he's allowed. He's allowed to do it. Now my body is not going to handle that. Uh, simply just with my past knee injuries that um, are still lingering two to three days is a great wheelhouse number. Uh, it allows me to recover properly and to be my best when I go into squat. But yeah, uh, comparison is one of those things, uh, especially with social media. Everybody wants to be like, oh, this person does this. I'm like, well, you're not them. You right. don't have their experience. Uh, I know with my girls, everybody wants to be Marissa Inda. Well, guess what? Marissa Inda is in her 40s. She has a bodybuilding background. And yes, yeah, she's one of the best powerlifters in the world. But you have to look at how long she's been doing. You're 22 and you've been powerlifting six months. She's been doing this for years. She has yeah. a different muscle maturity and muscle mass than you do. You haven't even grown into what your body is capable of yet. So, again, we could we could even relay this to to the very first question as far as like how can I make gains faster? Like, you might look at others, um, your coaches or whoever it is, and say like you know what the heck how how did they get like that so quick or like they go through a dieting phase and, and they're lean really quick or they go through a you know or you or you program them for a you know a getting ready for a meet and they do it in a, a shorter amount of time i'm not sure if i'm mm -hmm. going out on the right realm for your for your uh for strength but some people yeah you can actually introduce into a shorter period um Depending on the background and the numbers they have. Uh, yeah. But you don't know, like you just said, like you don't know their history. You don't know if they were like a world-class athlete in the past. Uh, right. Or you don't know how long they've been training. You don't know how, what their work ethic is, what they're doing outside of the gym. But there's a lot of factors that comes into it. It's not just, 
it's not like it's not just they're they're the same age as me and or they're only two years older than me and they're doing this much how come i'm only doing this much it, it just doesn't work like that you can't you can't compare yourself to others <laughs> no and i think i think um going back to like what you're talking about going back to making gains faster um fitness is a lifelong endeavor powerlifting bodybuilding is a game of attrition the longer you can stay in the better off you will be too many people in both of them uh they get out before they ever realize their potential um look at kai green kai green at 21 looks nothing like he looks now uh, in powerlifting to be considered an advanced lifter you either need an elite total or have five plus years powerlifting most of the people i have have six months but they're comparing themselves to these people who have five something years. Uh, I go back to Marissa Inda. Marissa Inda is coached by Chad Wesley Smith, one of the best powerlifting coaches you'll find. She has the best nutritionist through Renaissance periodization. Closely, it seems like too. Very, very closely. Um, and that's not to say you and I aren't great at what we do, but no, we're, no, no. we're we're not Chad Wesley Smith, who has you know Dr. Mike Isratel and all these right. other people working intimately with Marissa Inda to get her on that world level. We're just, at least for me, I've only That's been doing this. That's poster girl, so they take right. care of her. <laughs> I've only been doing this two and a half years, so there's no way, even even in the learning aspect, I can't compare myself to Chad Wesley Smith as a coach. I don't have the time in. I don't have the experience. So you have to take that as a lifter, too. Don't compare yourself to somebody, period, but definitely don't compare yourself to somebody who's got a totally different background and experience than you do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I don't know, it's just so huge and you can't be stressed enough. Just do your own thing. Worry about yourself. Like, absolutely. It'll get you so much farther than you, than you know. Stay in your lane, as the kids say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so we're just going to end with this one. Um, how do you maintain your body? composition once you've hit your goals all right so if you don't mind I'll, I'll take the wheel on this one by all means uh, all right so it's it's very you know it's it's a lot easier on paper <laughs> than than people make it out to be and it it's as simple as you know I'm assuming this question is for someone that has been dieting for a certain amount of time and then uh, hit hit their goal weight and want to kind of maybe stay at that weight. Uh, so what I would do is slowly increase your calories. So slowly increase what you've been doing. Basically, you're you're going backwards from where you started. All right. So if you are doing if you, six days of cardio a week, maybe limit it to five days while increasing your calories by like two or three hundred depending maybe maybe right in between like 250 calories uh you don't want to go too low like a a good gauge is like 10 percent. you know maybe a, a 10 percent increase in your calories because everyone's going to be different so right start doing that and maybe take a day off of your cardio so if you're going six days a week for 30 minutes or whatever the you know wherever you're at then go five days a week for 30 minutes. Uh, and that's a, just a, an example again. Mm -hmm. So slowly do that until, and you, while you're doing this, you want to be able to, you want to be weighing yourself still. Because if you are gaining weight, then you got to, you're finding your maintenance level. Basically what you're trying to do is find your maintenance level. And, uh, and that's kind of in short, how how you're gonna hit your maintain your weight while you're there and then from there you can recomposition well which is gain muscle and lose fat uh, but yeah slowly it's called reverse dieting um, or whatever they're calling it now so slowly reversing out of the process that you started with and it's mentally it becomes it can become frustrating because I've had clients they have done this and are still losing weight. So then you have to take a little bit more of an aggressive approach by increasing calories a little bit more. 
um, because you're still in deficit. Right. So that's in short, that's basically how you, how you do that. Well, I, I think you, I, I think you hit the nuts and bolts on that part, which I completely agree with. So I'm going to just take a little different direction. So we're not just beating yeah. a dead horse because yeah, I'm, I agree. <laughs> um, understand that this is a lifestyle. This is not something you do for a season, especially for this question. You want to maintain body composition. We're not talking about people who are just doing this for a photo shoot or just for a short period of time or for some. If you're truly trying to maintain body composition for the long haul, you need to realize that this is for the long haul. This is a lifestyle. You don't go from eating vegetables and lean meats and then go eat like a dickhead. Like, okay, now, well, I'm done. Let's see. Like, I'm just going to go back to what I used to eat before. Um, that's not to say you can't start adding those things in because, as, as you said, you're increasing uh, your caloric intake. And on those foods that you would eat while dieting, they're very voluminous foods, but they're also very low in calories a lot of times, you know, like vegetables and things like that. So you can add a few things that are going to take big chunks out of it. Uh, of your calories on days you just don't want to eat that. I'm not saying go get a bunch of McDonald's, but you know right. it's okay if you want to go grab like you know some nuggets and a like some six piece nuggets and some fries because it's going to be very cal calorically dense. And you know you, you might go, you can get away with a little bit more. You absolutely you can do that because you now have a higher intake, but you can't make that a staple of all your meals. You still need to you know, eat healthy, nutritious foods, you know, um, while you're going to cut back on the cardio, like we said, because you're trying to find that maintenance level, you can't just drop cardio, period. Um, it's all about systematically peeling back on what you were doing until you find a nice comfort level that keeps you at that body composition you want. Um, you don't want to go from one extreme to the other unless, you know, uh, unless you're trying to start gaining, which is for another time. But if we're talking about simply maintaining body composition, you hit that point where, you know, you're sitting at like 12, 13% body fat, you know, a nice healthy one where you're not killing yourself because a lot of times if you, if you really look at bodybuilding, you're literally killing yourself by the end because you're starving yourself and things like that. Um, with bodybuilding, you know, the, uh, the, the saying goes, you bodybuilding, you, you enter your competition at your weakest, and powerlifting, you enter your competition at your strongest. Because it's two different things. Because you have to drop your calories so low to get peeled. But when you're you guys, me, just to just to touch on it real quick, uh, when he's talking about bodybuilding, he's talking about like actual getting on stage. Yeah, yeah, he's talking about actually. He's not talking about. You know, I'm just. Assuming that you're not yeah. talking about the the general person that's no, just no, God, trying no. to cut fat, uh, no. you're talking about someone that's trying to get on stage right. at an actual eight percent body fat or seven percent right. body fat, uh, which the if you're general about population that, is not going to be able to. Or that's for men and for women, it's a little bit higher, the twelve percent. Uh, and once again, this goes back to the person. I'm sorry. I was going to say, once again, this goes back to the person because um, yeah. some people, even to get low, you kind of really have to dip into calories even if you don't want to. I know people um, that tend to be really hard losers. Like for me, um, to really see some substantial loss, I have to dip below 2,000 calories. Right. I mean like down to like 1,600, 1,700 right. on my 225 frame. So right. It depends on the person, but no. Um, yeah, I don't mean for like the general public, like you're getting down and you're killing yourself, but generally speaking, you are eating less food than you normally would at maintenance. So it's kind of like you're not necessarily fueling your body in the same manner that you normally would be. Anytime you guys are not eating at maintenance, you're basically uh, <laughs> starving yourself. <laughs> in, a, in, <laughs> in, in essence, it's, it's just the degrees vary person to person. But yeah, you're right. definitely a uh, – your body wants X amount of calories to be at maintenance, and you're saying, I'm denying you that for this goal that I have, which there's nothing wrong with. I think it's great to see how far you can push your body as long as you're doing it in a safe manner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's just – it's and it's, uh, it's the same thing. You want to do it slowly but not slow to the point where you are – you know, you're – Lift, you know, a good, a good way to gauge it again is your lifts, um, weighing yourself and also the mirror. Like, oh, absolutely. Clothes, too. Clothes are huge, the way yeah. they fit. 
They don't lie. <laughs> yeah, clo- clothes don't lie. Um, I, you know, I kind of, for the general public and even some of my girls, don't tie your aesthetic goals completely to the scale. The scale is a tool. Um, and I think a lot of people, and I'm sure you've dealt with this, where that scale is the end all be all. Doesn't matter how great they look, they right. in their mind that scale says this number, and yeah. I'm fat because of it or whatever. And it's like I lost oh, eight inches off my waist, but I've only lost two pounds. Right, and in that case, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like you. Your body is completely recomposition in the greatest of ways, but you're so focused on this one number that you're not paying attention to the big picture. So it's kind of as a you know. Use these things as a tool, not as your end all be all, and don't definitely don't attach your self worth to these numbers, um, right. especially that scale. Because you know you might be five six and you know relatively lean, but in your mind the scale says, "Oh, I'm one twenty five. I'm huge." I'm like, but you're not. Like, yeah, I could I could name off, especially in powerlifting. I'm sure you can in bodybuilding. A lot of people that are you know, great looking physiques, but might be at a higher weight. Um, I, I told one of my clients recently, uh, cause she comes from, I think a bikini background. Um, and I flat out told her, they don't care what you weigh on stage. All that matters is how you look. So really when you take exactly. that, when you take that as far as progress, use the scale to say, Hey, okay, I'm up, I'm down. We can make adjustments, but this does not define my progress as a whole. Right. Right. Yeah, sometimes we uh, recomposition without even knowing it, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. uh, or not not to say that it wasn't planned or anything, but again, don't let the number on that scale be your end all. So that's why, me personally, I like clients, you know, because it's it's my realm. I like pictures, measurements, weigh-ins. Because sometimes your, your weight will stay the same, but you look completely different. Or your weight will stay the same, but measurements have changed. You know? Oh, absolutely. So, I've, gone, I've gone up two pounds and my weight's gone down. So it's kind of like it's, it, it, you, you use everything as a measurement, not one single yardstick. Right. Yeah, and don't um, – and, and do it. <laughs> like actually measure your progress because a lot of people – just kind of take it as like, oh, well, you know, I'm eating the same foods or whatever it is. This goes for not just maintaining, but for everything. Oh, I'm eating the same foods. But if you're not, if you're serious about it, like if you just kind of want to get by it, that's fine. Um, but if you have some serious weight to lose or you're seriously trying to make your body look completely different, then you have to do what's necessary. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to, uh, you know. Make the sacrifice now um, for your goal, and uh, we can get into this. I would love to touch on this on the next one about how flexible dieting isn't always flexible. I think right. I, I think I think that's a good little teaser for anybody watching this. That depending one on your video goal alone, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trust me, we can we can talk all day, but flexible dieting is not always flexible depending on your goal. So, um, you know, if you guys enjoy this, I, I definitely think that is something we're going to touch on. So you're going to want to come back to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for now, um, you know, this is a good gauge for strength training and, and fat loss and, and weight loss. So I think we've touched on at least the majority of them. So, mm-hmm. you know, we hope you guys enjoyed it. For today, that's all the questions we'll cover, uh, if that's all right with you. Oh, I've had a great time. That's great with me. I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, no, I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for being here and sharing your knowledge. And, you know, hopefully we'll see more of you in the future. And, again, guys, we're going to link all our uh, books, IG, everything down in the description. So please go check that stuff out. Follow us uh, on IG for more great stuff. (laughs) <laughs> um, but no thank you so much for for joining for joining me today Stephen. i appreciate it it was an awesome time thank you all right we'll uh we'll see you guys on the next video